What's going on, guys? Jason Frosto for The Breaking Point, and welcome to this episode. We're going to recap the Cincinnati 2023 final between Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz. If you want the breakdown, stay tuned. Coming up next. So really, both of these players are absolute monsters, right? So this match is a very highly anticipated match between kind of the new guard, right? The younger guys and the old guard, the established GOAT. Djokovic at this point with 23 slams. Alcaraz was able to beat him at the 2023 Wimbledon final in five sets. And I feel like Djokovic kind of felt like in that match, he should have probably won. But Alcaraz came up with the goods and came up with amazing shots to beat Djokovic in that match. And this is match number four between these two great players, right? Alcaraz again winning the last match at Wimbledon 2023. But overall, the head-to-head is 2-1 to one Alcaraz, the last loss before that for him, or the only loss coming at the 2023 French Open, which he said were because of nervousness and anxiety. And just a couple things to think about with these Cincinnati courts, right? One of the biggest things that I've seen is the courts are moving pretty quickly. The ball's flying through the air, but the bounce of the court is extremely high. So it's hitting and it's dipping and it's dropping. But then as soon as it hits the court, the ball's basically just jumping straight right back up again, right up into the strike zone or above the shoulders pretty consistently. So in this match, that was a really big factor in terms of how the play played out. Djokovic being six foot three, Alcaraz being six foot tall. So you'd favor Djokovic mostly in these situations where height is involved, but Alcaraz did a very good job of handling some of these higher bouncing balls. Another major factor in this match, we had extremely hot temperatures in Mason, Ohio, aka Cincinnati, right? It's in Mason, 91 degree temps, I believe, in the afternoon at this point. Very sunny, very hot, and very humid. So this could affect both players. And I personally think in some ways actually affect Djokovic a little bit more, right? And what we saw from the first set was he had a very tight first set. And we just look at the stats for that first set right away. Winners here, Alcaraz 11-6. to six. Alcaraz hitting more winners on the ground strokes, 4-3 to three forehand and backhand, but then also hitting more aces, so a more effective first serve, right? And then the second thing that we see, which might be a little bit shocking from these numbers, is that Djokovic actually lost the baseline battle, right? 27 points for Alcaraz, one on the baseline, and just 19 one for Djokovic on the baseline. So Djokovic was losing the baseline battle consistently to Alcaraz because Alcaraz, again, a little bit younger, a little more firepower, a little more energy and more explosion off the court. And he seemed to be dealing with the heat better than Novak was. And if you look at some more numbers from the first set, right, we see with Alcaraz making 72% of his first serves and winning 71% of those. On his second serve, he was winning 63% of those points. And if you look at the numbers for Djokovic, right, 58% first serves in, but only winning 48% of the points on his first serve. So Alcaraz doing a tremendous job on his second serve. Djokovic was actually winning a higher percentage of points on his second serve than he was his first serve in this match against Alcaraz. Alcaraz, a very good returner, returned very well at Wimbledon. If we just look at these points a little bit deeper, right, we can see a couple extra things here. Average ground stroke speed, these guys were about even. Alcaraz, 74 miles an hour average on his forehand in the first set and 68 miles an hour on the backhand. But Alcaraz did slice 17% of the time on his strokes where Djokovic was just at 5% on the slice, right? So Alcaraz was slicing considerably more than Djokovic was. So even though the ground stroke speeds were pretty similar between the two players, Alcaraz was using more variety, right, with drop shots and just slices to return serves within the points. He does have more variety and a little bit more hand skill, I personally think, than Djokovic does, and he was using that to his advantage. And let's just take a deeper look inside some of the stat insights, right? We can see that in this match, first set, Djokovic was attacking 19% of the time in attack mode, and Alcaraz was at 18%. So Djokovic plus one percentage-wise. And then what's also incredible is Djokovic realizes that Alcaraz is such a good defender that Alcaraz could match him defensively, and they were equal at 42% apiece in the steal category, which Djokovic isn't really used to facing unless he's playing somebody like a Rafael Nadal. But for the most part, Djokovic is used to being the better defender and converting more on counters and steals than his opponent does. And then the next thing to look at from the first set, right, is just quality of shots. So the ATP Tour does a great job of providing these stats now in matches and tells you what the quality of someone's shots are. So if you look at the serve in particular, Alcaraz was at 8.2 quality of serve, Djokovic at 7.7. The tour average is 7.5. So Alcaraz considerably above that and Djokovic a little bit above that. If we look at the return of serve, this is Djokovic's biggest strength usually. 
Alcaraz 7.1 to 6.5 for Novak, so a more effective returner in the first set than Djokovic was. If you look at the ground strokes, right, forehands in particular, 7.8 to Alcaraz, 6.6 to Djokovic. If you look at the Djokovic-Fritz match, Djokovic was at 9.4 on his quality of ball on the forehand side. Different opponent, right, different circumstance, but here Alcaraz consistently beat Djokovic in the forehand battle in this match in the first set. 7.8 7.8 to 6.6. And then how about backhands, right? Djokovic is supposed to be the master on the backhand side and basically the best on tour head-to-head, but he lost that battle 7.7 quality of shot versus 7.3. So Alcaraz beat Djokovic literally in every single major category, serve, return, forehand, and backhand in the first set. And I think that shocked Djokovic. They had played at Wimbledon, yes, but I think Djokovic felt in some situations he had the upper hand. And that he felt like if they played on a hard court, things would be a little bit different than on grass, right? A more slick surface. I think Djokovic felt like here on a hard court, he would have the advantage. But in the first set, Alcaraz literally showed him that he could beat him in every single stack category in terms of quality. So kind of one of the things I was thinking about at this point is like, has age finally caught up to Djokovic? There are some things I've noticed about Novak's game that I haven't talked about yet before in some of our other match analysis. But I do think to Djokovic has lost a step or two footwork-wise at the age of 36, and or Carlos is just making him look a little slower than he used to. I'm not sure, again, if it's just the age part of it or Carlos moving so well that he makes Novak look a step slow, but Djokovic does look a step slow to me when he's playing against Alcaraz. And again, it could just be because Alcaraz is so speedy and quick around the court. Another thing from this match that makes Alcaraz kind of wise beyond his years his use of the kick serve and understanding that this court was a very high bouncing court. So what he was frequently doing, right, on the ad side on really big points, especially I think it was 3-4 in the second set, was he was using his kick serve really well on the ad side to get the ball above Djokovic's shoulders and then get Djokovic to cough up a short ball in the return and then finishing on that shot. And just another thing that was a really big factor in this match, right, Djokovic admittedly had a little bit of heat stroke at the end of the first set And the beginning of the second set, his face was beat red at one point in the match. And you could tell he was extremely exhausted. The heat and the sun were kind of beating down on him. And part of the court was shaded one side and the other side was completely in the sun. So Djokovic was having a ton of problems with that 91 degree heat temperature out there. And he was really struggling. At one point, he called the trainers, I believe. And he kind of had an extended break because of the possibility of heat stroke and heat exhaustion, which is very, very dangerous. Novak was down a break in the second set, right? And it looked like this match was basically over. He was struggling physically. But one thing he tried to do at that point was try to junk it up a little bit with Carlos and try to bring him down to a little bit lower level because we talked about the first set stats showed Alcaraz beat Djokovic on the serve, the return, the forehand, and the backhand. He beat him in every single quality category that there is. But in the second set, Djokovic, right, tried to mix things up and do things a little differently. Threw a little bit more junk and spin on the ball, right? Tried to slow things down. That break that he had between the first and second set at that point gave him a little bit of a break and also may have interrupted a little bit of Alcarez's rhythm, right? I think Djokovic realized that if he tried to go toe-to-toe with Alcarez and just bang away, that Carlos was beating him left, right, front, and center. It didn't matter Where the points were going, if Djokovic wanted to try pace with Alcaraz, Alcaraz was basically stepping up and beating him at that game. So Djokovic needed to slow everything down, get Alcaraz out of a rhythm, and try to beat him instead of just pure power, try to mix things up a little bit more. So Djokovic did that. If we look at the set two stats, right? We can see winners here. Alcaraz 12-6 to versus Djokovic. Unforced errors 14 versus Novak 17. And then on top of that, if we just look a little bit at unreturned serves, we noticed that Alcaraz had a little bit of a mental slip. So he missed a lot more return of serves, right? Djokovic had 16 unreturned serves that came off his racket and Alcaraz was much more locked in in the first set returning serve than he was in the second set. Again, this little bit of a mental lull. The other thing that Djokovic did, right? He started serving balling on some pretty big key points because Alcaraz buried himself pretty far back in the court and Djokovic took that opportunity to come in and try to serve and volley. So look at the net points one in the second set. We see Djokovic, right, 11 for 14. And again, in the baseline exchanges, Alcaraz was 21 for 47 and Djokovic just 16 to 38. So Alcaraz was winning a higher number of baseline exchanges. Djokovic knew he needed to come in to break rhythm, 
keep him a little bit mentally off and try to take some of that big hitting rhythm away from him. And this definitely worked for Djokovic, right? First serve percentage in, 59% first serves in, winning 83% of those. His numbers were much lower in the first set compared to the second set. And then if we look at the second serve returns made for Alcaraz, right, and the first serves, Alcaraz was only making 50% of his first serve returns back into the court. He was much higher in the first set. And second serves really slipped for Alcaraz, 69% in in the second set. And Djokovic was much higher there at 83%. So Alcaraz's numbers really came down. And again, his level dropped. And Djokovic got him to have a little bit of a break in his focus and concentration, and Djokovic took advantage of that. It seemed like Alcaraz got a little bit tentative once he didn't feel the ball as well anymore, and his average forehand speed dropped six miles an hour compared to the first set, right? So definitely was taking less pace on the ball, hitting it softer, hitting it with more spin. He was not as confident as he was in the first set after Djokovic mixed things up with a little bit of net play and took a little bit of pace off himself. If we look at the insights, right, for the second set, we can see some different things. Djokovic attacking 28% of the time compared to Alcaraz is just 17%. Remember, they were within 1% of each other in the first set. But in the second set, Djokovic took much more of an aggressive overall tone in the points than Alcaraz did. Alcaraz got a little more defensive. And then look at the steal numbers. Djokovic 35% and Alcaraz just 21%. They were 42% apiece in the first set. So Djokovic's defense was still pretty good and Alcaraz's decreasingly went down in the second set. And then if we just look at the shot quality, right, in that second set, Alcaraz 7.9 in the serve, Djokovic 7.2, so Alcaraz wins that category. But look at the return to serve. Alcaraz 4.1, missing so many returns. Djokovic 6.9, so now Djokovic wins the return battle. And then the forehand, Alcaraz still 7.1, which a pretty big drop from the first set, but Djokovic 6.7, and then Alcaraz 7.2 on the backhand, and Djokovic 7.1. So Alcaraz still beating Djokovic in the ground game with quality of ball. It was pretty incredible, even when he wasn't playing as well. So then we get into the third set, guys, right? And this thing was just an absolute dogfight. The athleticism, the quality of shots, everything here, the energy at Cincinnati, everything was absolutely incredible. I couldn't believe the level of tennis that we were witnessing, right? In this heat, especially, especially after we had the Wimbledon battle, this just felt like an even higher quality of tennis. And in many eyes, it really was the best non-Grand Slam match in history. So if we look at the insights for the third set, right? Djokovic, 22% attacking. Alcaraz, just 16% in attack mode. And then if we look at the steals, Alcaraz was playing quite a bit better defense in the third set, recovered from that second set lull, 38% in the steal category, with Djokovic down into 29%, right? So he kind of turned the tables again. Djokovic got up the break in the third, and we thought he was going to seal it out. He ended up needing five match points, but he wasn't able to seal the deal. And part of that was Alcaraz's incredible defensive skills. And then if we just look at the shot quality in that third set, right, serves Alcaraz way down, 6.6, Djokovic at 7.4. Look at the return of serve. Again, Djokovic ahead on the return here, 6.8 to 5.6. So Alcaraz returned very well in the first set, had a major drop off in the second set down to 4.1, which is extremely low for him, and then recovered a little bit to 5.6. But I will credit the third set to saying that Djokovic served a little bit better with his spots and did a bit better job of making excellent quality serves, right? And if we look at the forehands right here, again, Djokovic really stepped up in the third set, quality of forehand 7.9, but Alcaraz 8.1 beat him off the ground for the third set in a row. And then backhands, Djokovic finally got the better of Carlos, 7.8 on the backhand side. Djokovic really locked it down to Carlos's 7.6, which is still very strong. But Novak really stepped it up in the third set. The depth on the backhand, the width of the backhand, basically how they measure the quality of ball on your strokes at the ATP level with the stats that they're using is the width, the depth, the pace, and what it's doing to your opponent, right? So if it's doing damage or it's putting them in tough positions, or if you're giving them easy balls to work with. Djokovic, again, 7.8 on that backhand. Incredible numbers there. And then finally, we'll look at the overall match numbers, right? We kind of went set by set. But overall, total winners, Alcaraz 42 to Djokovic's 19. Alcaraz 50 unforced errors to Djokovic's 46. 22 of those forehand winners for Alcaraz came on his forehand side. Nine were on the backhand side, 11 aces, right? And for Novak, 10 on the forehand side for winners, seven on the backhand side, and just two aces for Djokovic, but a lot of good spot serving. 
If we look at the number of unreturned serves, Djokovic stepped it up in the third set, right? The second set, 42 unreturned serves compared to Alcaraz's 31. And then if we look at the baseline points won, Alcaraz plus 13 over Novak, total points won at the baseline. But then the net points, right? Djokovic plus seven. Djokovic essentially realized this is a more athletic and younger version of myself at the baseline. I cannot just sit here and trade with this guy. I need to start coming in a little bit. I need to mix up spins and different things to try to take him out of his rhythm. And then I might have a chance to come back. I guess in recent times is the first time he's probably felt outmatched in recent times on a hard court by any opponent. It was just kind of incredible what Alcaraz was coming up with. And remember the shot speeds for Djokovic in the first and second set average forehand miles per hour. And then look at the overall numbers, right? He ends up at 75 miles an hour on the forehand side, 68 on the backhand. He did step up his speed more in that third set and did a great job off the ground. He also won more first serve points as the match went on. It ended up being 67% for the entire match, right? Compared to just 48% of first serve points won in the first set. So Djokovic made some really good adjustments, kind of hung in there, hung tough. But really, honestly, Alcaraz won the ground game and Djokovic found a way to kind of work around that, hang around, and still try to get a win in the match. I was really impressed by Alcaraz playing the high bounces of the court, especially the ad side kick serve. He went to the well on that time and time again and would hit the kick, follow it in for a serve and volley, or hit the kick to Djokovic's backhand, wait for the short ball, and then snap the winner. And he would do it in very important moments. He'd point to his head and be like, you know, I'm thinking about what I'm doing. And his box would look over and say the same thing. Very impressive for a 20-year-old to know when and how to use the court. The other thing, very impressive for Alcaraz, obviously, the use of the drop shot, especially on the forehand side. Djokovic realized if the drop shot's coming from Alcaraz's forehand side, it's so well disguised that he has such a tough time picking it up that it's probably going to be a winner a lot of the time. If he gets the return to Alcaraz's backhand side, if it's a, even if it's a weak return, he has a better chance of reading the backhand drop shot disguise than he does Alcaraz's forehand side. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this episode of The Breaking Point, analyzing the Cincinnati 2023 final between Alcaraz and Djokovic. If you want to see more content like this, drop a comment below, leave a question, drop a like, make sure you subscribe. I'm Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. I'll see you next time.